شیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the universe, the master of the day of judgment. I bear witness and testimony to the oneness of Allah, to his magnificence, his omnipotence, his might, his glory, to his being the creator and sustainer of all things, the giver of life, the guider of hearts, the master of the day of judgment. And I bear witness to the fact that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and final messenger. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. It is said that the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was defined as being the very personification of the Qur'an. That the wife of the Prophet describes him when asked what is his character she says that his character it is the Quran and in some narrations after she establishes this she then recites the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Mu'minun indicating that the content of those verses are also indicative of what his character is and where we have discussed the first couple of verses and looked at what they entail, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The initial premise that the believers indeed have succeeded. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those that have in their prayer khushra, focus, concentration, attentiveness. And then briefly we started to look at the next verse. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِدُونَ That those who they avoid this thing of لَغْو And identifying and defying it, it necessitates going back to the first verse that says that that success that is promised to those who have believed is something that we want to actually aspire towards. And the Mufassireen, when they describe it, that falah, they say that it is nothing less than Jannah. May Allah make us people of paradise and make us those who embody the characteristics in this world of those who want to be in paradise. And so here when the verse is giving us indication that those who avoid this thing, the avoidance of it necessitates us again affirming for ourselves that we want Jannah so badly, we're going to do what this verse says is a means through which you can acquire it. This thing of lahu is identified as those things, those actions that bear no benefit or detriment. They are done in vain, they have futility as a defining characteristic. There's just really no point or purpose to it. When we think about religion, we think about spirituality, quite often we think about it in the frames of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs and in a very mechanical, legalistic way. And that is there, but it's complemented by a system of ethics, morals, values, ideals, that ours is a tradition that is rooted in fundamental understanding of the need to be a person that aspires towards beauty, goodness, mercy, compassion, and love. And many of the things that take us away from living to our full potential, embodying our full light, are not that we are engaged in the most atrocious of activities. It's that we're just spending our time doing things that really don't make that much of a difference in any which way or form. We have everyone, please move up. Like how every Friday I say 12 times, everyone please move up. 
Really, what's the point? <laughs> you can fill in the carpet that's in front of you. It would be appreciated. The lines are there just for when we stand for prayer. Also with the sisters as well. And so where consciousness leaves, but we start to think about what distracts us from it. In the work that I do, I sit with a lot of people in a lot of different situations. And I've been with many people as they enter into the last stages of their life in this world. And may Allah make the best of our deeds the last of our deeds. And I can tell you when I'm talking to people from any culture, any race, any class, even whether they are of our faith or a different faith, there's nobody who, when they know that their time in this world is coming to an end, says, man, I wish I had some more time to spend on Instagram or Facebook. I wish that I had more time to go and argue with my loved ones. I wish I could just spend one more hour behind a desk in an office. We're staring at a screen to see numbers go up and down in terms of what is in my bank account. Or I wish I could spend another time abusing somebody or being racist or breaking a promise. But when they're sitting in those moments, they say that I wish I hadn't done those things. I wish I actually went and saw my child do the things that he or she enjoys doing. I wish when I had the opportunity to be forgiving, I actually forgave. I wish when there was opportunity for me to live the life that I wanted to, not just the one I was supposed to, that I actually went and lived that life. But most of them don't say, I wish I went and did what I was doing for the majority of the minutes of the hours that were allocated to me in this world. And that's what you really want to think about in that moment. And not in a morbid sense, but where you have the benefit on this blessed day of Jummah to look with an air of foresight that you are standing now and you know that your last moments are upon you. Would you want to have the time to do more of what you do the most of? Would you want to have some time to do something that's different? And again, most of us aren't spending our time doing things that are insanely terrible, inshallah. <laughs> Nobody hijacked anything this morning. Nobody committed highway robbery. You're not out there dealing drugs to middle schoolers in Washington Square Park. But even just in the day that is halfway done, if you look back to it, how much time did you spend just looking at one of these? How much time did you spend just looking at somebody you care for? Our tradition, it tells us that when you look at the Kaaba, you get ajr just by looking at it. In that same gaze, it says that when you look at your parents, you also just gain baraka, you gain ajr from that. That futility is not something that is just identified without foundation to it. But when it is identified in our tradition, a baseline definition says that everything that does not have the remembrance of God, that can be identified as level. Because you know that when you can preface any action, decision, perspective, which is still a choice, how you see things is a choice. With a conscious understanding of God prior to commencing it, likely it's not going to then lead to something that has no purpose or point. But it's going to precede something that will allow for you to say, is this really what I want to use my time for? The cliches, they bear a lot of truth to them. 
that of the things that we have access to, that how we use them will never allow for it to come back to us regardless of the way that we engage in it. Your time and your attention are two things that once they go, you don't get them back. Where there's not a plan, there's not a strategy, there's not an understanding that says that if I am not designing my life, it doesn't mean that somebody else isn't designing it for me. And the corporation, the company, the job that wants to be able to allow for you to do more for it so that it can make more money that it's not even giving to you in the first place. It's going to stick into your head the idea that you are in your entirety what you do as a profession and there's nothing more or less to you. And you chase after dunya, you chase after dunya, you chase after dunya at the expense of finding meaning, depth, purpose, beauty in everything and everyone that's around you. And it's just constant mechanics, constant rote, constant habit. Everything is done without the one thing that makes us different from the rest of creation, the ability to think, to make choices and be present in that decision making. Atah bin Abi Rabah, rahimahullah, a man who is from the generation of the Tabi'een, those who come after the generation of the Sahaba, he is known as a great Mufassirin, he is a great scholar. He is of a Nubian heritage. It means that he is black, as many of the great scholars of our tradition were. Atah bin Abi Rabah, he says that he sees two companions of the Prophet وسلم, speaking about this thing of lahu. And then they identify things that are not considered to be lahu. And they say spending time with one's family, that's not lahu, it's not a waste of time. Running between two lines, that's not lahu, it's not a waste of time. Taking care of one's mount, one's steed, it's not lahu, it's not a waste of time. And swimming, they say, is not a waste of time. The most obvious understandings can resonate within us to spend time with one's family. But subjectively, you have to decide where and how you do it. And the determination of it is not based off of the things that simply you feel that have meaning in them. So there's times when I go and sit with my mother and it's the middle of the night and I got to tell her to get up because the Indian program she's watching on some satellite that is the strangest thing I've ever seen is still something I could say, why am I watching this? Or I could say, how lucky am I that I'm able to still sit with my mother and share in this moment with her. I can make every justification and every excuse as to why somebody else is going to tell me what fun they had watching my child, my son, my daughter do amazing things. Or I could say that no, my eyes are going to witness that and I'm going to make the time for it. The elasticity of time is such that we can play a role in determining what it is that's a priority for us, but you have to decide what you're going to put first and then start off with it. And when you say, I just don't have time for these things, you're not just lying to the person you're saying it to, you're lying to yourself. Because if tomorrow the pipe that fuels your toilet broke, and the plumber said, I'm coming either Saturday or Sunday between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. You know you'd be sitting in your house for 12 hours straight waiting for them. If God forbid your internet stopped, your laptop just stopped working or your cell phone broke, everything would just paralyze itself around you and you'd go to whatever place you needed to or wait for the internet cable man to come to your house again for eight or nine hours 
Where did the time come from if you were too busy for it to happen? And if you can make eight hours happen so that the thing that distracts you in the first place starts working again, you could probably build into your routine a regular 15, 20, 30 minutes that lets you spend time with the people that you love, the people that love you. And to not define and identify in what is understood to be the most correct or best way to spend that time. Because our prophet man, he ran races with his wife. He played games with children. He laughed, he joked with his companions. Not just do those people not get to benefit from the presence of your heart within the context of their hearts, but your heart deprives yourself of the moments that you can get from feeling uplifted and invigorated by having those moments and experiences actually be experienced by you. But the lahu, it's there. And it's gonna tell you to just do the things that give complacency instantaneous gratification and chase after it to whatever extent and again frame it in realities because the last breaths that come upon us usually also come with a lot of heartfelt contemplation and reflection when people know that they're starting to lose their time and it's just apparent that mortality is a real thing for everybody it's when usually they say, what was I doing up until this point? And why did I do it that way? The running between two lines might be a heavy thing to understand for some of us. Because they're indicating that exercise is an important thing to do. And when we're in a place where the chasing after the world that keeps us from spending time with companions, family, and loved ones, it likely also has most of us who are sitting in this room just sitting for most of the day. Your body has a right over you. It is the vessel that Allah has chosen for your soul to be in in this world. And aside from the food you fuel it with, the drink that you fuel it with, and all the other things that you fuel it with, it requires regular engagement, a physical upkeep, regardless of what your age is. And you don't have to be somebody who is in a space where an hour a day, three hours a day, five hours a day, you're stuck in a gym. But when you build out that schedule, that calendar, and you make you, your heart, your entire being a priority as a starting point, you say that I build good habits in just 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, but a regular course of experience. That the hadith, it says that the stronger believer is better than the weaker believer. And you can understand that from an internal standpoint, but also an external standpoint. And our Prophet وسلم, even as he went from 40 to 60 in the years of revelation, he was physically strong and physically sound. And I don't know about you, but I know in the culture that I come from, people don't take care of their bodies. My family is Kashmiri. My father grew up in Gualmundi in Lahore. I went to Handi on Lexington in Curry Hill, and the brother was trying to give me some amazing desi food that tastes so good. <laughs> Literally on top of like one of the food areas, there was just all the grease and oil that was in it, right? And I said, hey man, I don't really want so much of that. And so he just took a cup, scooped it all up, and then just drank it. That says amazing. <laughs> the number of family members that I have seen as they get older 
have challenges with obesity, have challenges with diabetes, have all kinds of heart conditions, cholesterol problems. May Allah make it easy for all of us. <laughs> Whose habits did not start when they were at that age, but at a much younger age where there wasn't consciousness or awareness that there will come a time. And people say to me that, why are you spending the amount of time you spend stretching, exercising, doing this and doing that? My father's father was six foot four, as was my mother's father. My grandmothers were both 4'10". See where I landed in the gym pool. <laughs> but every day that my grandfather, my father's father, lived with us towards the end of his life, even into his 70s, 80s, he would get up in the morning, go stand in front of our house in his shalvar kameez, large man, and he would just stretch for an hour. There wasn't a day that I didn't see him until probably the last month of his life when he couldn't walk anymore. That he didn't spend a good chunk of his day walking as much as he could outside of our house. Because even then, the body needs to be taken care of. When you're spending time engaged in distractions, with foresight, you want to understand that when they say, why do you do it? I want to be able to play with my son and my daughter and run around with them in a field. I want to be able to lift my wife up the way the Prophet ﷺ was able to carry his wife on his shoulders. I want to be in a place where I don't wake up and my back is hurting because I use it so much in a way that it's not meant to be because there's not even a muscle in my stomach that helps to support my entire being. But I also want to be able to feel full contentment. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, there is overlap with our physical upkeep in taking care of our bodies. And here, Atta bin Abi Rabah, when he hears these two companions, he say it to them in a way that understands twice over the running between two lines and swimming. It's not a waste of time. The trick to it is that you just got to find something that you enjoy doing. If you try to work your body out in something that you hate, you will not do it. And the time of day that you likely have the most control over is the early morning when nobody else has got your time on their schedules. So you wake up for Fajr and just spend 20 minutes. You like to run, go and run. You like to swim, go and swim. If you don't like to do anything, I don't know what to do for you, but you got to do something. Because when you get older, your older self is going to thank your younger self. And if you're already older, don't tell yourself you're too old to do it. You got to start doing it from now and thinking about what state you want to be in when you're leaving from this place. And then amongst them, when they say the taking care of one's steed, one's mount, that the things that you have responsibility over, the things that are given to you as gifts, as blessings, as ni'mas, you make sure to, with gratitude, give them the attention and care that they deserve. That it can be quite novel the first time you got your car, but if you had it for the next 10 years, you got to take care of it as best as you did from day one. That our Prophet literally has a masjid that millions of people go to every day in the city of Medina to Munawwara. May Allah grant us the tawfiq to visit that blessed place and end the tyrannical rules of the people who right now oversee it. But that wasn't his first masjid. The first masjid that our Prophet was able to establish after years of persecution was a masjid called Masjid Quba. And even after he had a masjid that shared a wall with his home, every week he would go either walking or riding to Masjid Quba to pray. And he would tell his companions that you go to that masjid and you pray, the reward of it is a completed pilgrimage. But he's not leaving behind the things that were important to him. He understands and appreciates and he takes care of it. 
You have a house, keep your house clean. You have a body, keep your body clean. Be in a place where you spend time taking care of the bounties, the gifts, the netmas, that you rejuvenate what it was that you understood it to be something meaningful to you by giving it the attention that it deserves. And when you start to let it go and you live it to the wayside and you just say that it's unimportant, not through your words, but by through your etiquette towards it. You're forgetting not just the bounty of it, but the one who gave it to you in the first place. And the nafs, it can be really, really strong at moments like that. Because its satiation is one that is never completely satisfied. And once it's given to you, it's let me misuse it and abuse it and not treat it in the way that it's meant to be until I just find something new to go and play with. But here, Atta bin Abi Rabah, he's hearing these men say that to take care of your steed, to take care of what it is that's under your care, to take care of what has been given to you, your bounties, your gifts, the ni'mas, it's not a waste of time. In Surah Al-Waqiyah, Allah Zawjal, He says, لا يسمعون فيها لغوا That you won't hear in the place of paradise, Jannah, anything that is lagu. And that thing of paradise, it is the epitome of purity and perfection. It will not tolerate even an atom's weight of impurity, anything of ugliness. You don't want to do the thing that can't even exist in Jannah. And you don't want your records to be filled with it, to be a means through which you meet Allah saying that this is what I did with the days that you gave to me. So try to cut the talk that has no point to it. To cut out the hours where you view the things that serve no purpose or benefit. To leave behind the deeds and the actions that do nothing for you or for anybody else. And to let mindfulness, consciousness, awareness be present in the decisions, the deeds, the choices, the actions that you undertake. The verse says, those who are essentially, they're running away from this thing of lagu when it's confronted to them. They are the ones, the Qur'an says, that will have that success. They will have that Jannah. إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسول you know, to build upon the interaction with people who are in their last moments of life, as much as I've sat with people who they live in a frame of regret, saying, why did I do the things that I did and use the time that I used in those ways? When you contrast it with individuals who they find contentment in their passing, and they're not in a state where they look back with regret or remorse, but they look back at a life that they found meaning through it and they lived purposefully. So on this day of Juma, spend just a few moments and close your eyes and envision yourself. Not in a state where you're afraid, but in a state where you understand it to be reality. That if somebody came to visit you in the last hours of your life, what would you want to be telling them about how you used your time and spent your life? And do you want to be in a place where you look back with regret? Or do you want to be in a place that says, I think that I used my time in a way that I feel really good about it. 
And then in between now and then, the decision's on you more than anyone else as to what you do with those hours. But if you determine that you don't want to be in a place where the last ones that you have are used in reflection backwards, use some of it today to say, where do I want to be going forward? And then make happen in the days in between the things that you know will get you to that place of real contentment, real fulfillment. And may Allah make us from amongst those who leave this world in a state excited to meet Him. In Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil awaleen wa fil akhireen Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallam ya arhamar rahimin Allahumma innaka afuan kareemun tuhibbu al-afwa faafu anna ya mukalib al-kulub thabbit kulubna ala dinik Allahumma ja'anna min al-mukhlisin Allahumma ja'anna min al-mukhlisin we begin this supplication in your name, Ya Allah, and beseech you to send your choicest salutations upon your most beloved, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. We ask that you shower your infinite mercy upon this gathering, granting each and every one who is present herein and our loved ones only the best in this world and the best in the next. We ask, Ya Allah, that if all of us are meant to be together only at this time, at this place, whether we are young or old, male or female, regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our social class, our country of origin, our cultural heritage, whether we are Muslim or come from a different walk of life, Ya Rabbi, if our individual hearts are meant to be in the presence of all other hearts that are gathered here, only at this time, at this place, then gather us all together again in the best of places in the world beyond this one. Increase us, Ya Allah, in all that is good. Increase us in courage, compassion, and confidence. Protect us from any affliction, anxiety, or anguish. Remove from our hearts any feelings of jealousy, bitterness, animosity, or envy towards any of your creation. Grant us hearts that are filled with understanding and hope. Hearts that are drawn to goodness and beauty. Hearts that find themselves in your remembrance. For indeed, in your remembrance do hearts find rest. Make us, Ya Allah, those who value the time that we have been given in this world. And let us be those whose decisions and actions, our choices, are reflective always that there is a world beyond this one. Help us, Ya Allah, to use the time that you have given to us as best as we can. To make time for our own care of our entire beings, our hearts, our souls. To take time to care for those who are around us, those that we love and those that love us. To spend our time in the creation of meaningful moments and experiences. And help us, Ya Allah, <coughs> to move away from those things that distract us, that take away our attention, that take away our presence. Forgive us, Ya Allah, for every word that we have uttered that served no purpose and had no meaning. Forgive us for every moment of gossip and backbiting, of idle and vain talk, and give us hearts, Ya Rabb, that commission the eyes that we see this world in, to see every opportunity of goodness that you send our way. And the tawfiq, Ya Allah, for the rest of our body to then act in accordance, to take advantage of that opportunity to do good. Ya Allah, make us people of benefit. On this blessed day of Jummah, Ya Allah, accept the dua, the prayers, the supplications of all those who are turning to you. And do not turn even one of us away. For those who find themselves in any situation of grief, of any type of duress, we turn to you and say that, Ya Salam, send upon all of us your divine peace as you are the source of peace. Make us a means of real peace and increase for your creation. Protect us always from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. Forgive us for our shortcomings and guide and bless us all. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. Wutub alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawab rahim Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khari khalkihi muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Wa qimu salam.